To quote Michigan legend Blake Corum, business is finished. Next on this week's episode of Michigan Podcast. But there's going to be one team that's going to play solely as a team. No man is more important than the team. No coach is more important than the team. The team, the team, the team. Let's see for Wait for it. Yep. Brady gets terrific. Closer and a touchdown night again. Schultz just before Brazil got him. And a leaping interception by Woodson. Harbaugh back to throw over the middle. Caught by Colazar at the five on his feet. Touchdown, Michigan. Five seven, 179 pounds, a junior at Michigan. But Jamie Morris packs a wallop, and he delivers for Bo Schindler. And here's your first play. Pressure coming. Sack. It is Glenn Steele, number 81, who fought his way through the traffic. Option. And Robinson calls his own number, and he's going to score. Oh, an easy touchdown for Ron Robinson and Michigan. championship again because we're going to play as a team and when we play as a team and the old season is over you and I know it's going to be Michigan again Michigan Go Blue, I'm Steve Dace. Welcome to this week's episode of Michigan Podcast. And yes, I thought about honoring the many requests to bring back the Blue Kool-Aid. But I actually think that what's been accomplished here by this program requires something beyond stunts, even fun-loving ones. Because we have just witnessed the most legendary run by the most legendary edition of this program, which in and of itself is legendary. It is quite possible the greatest defense, greatest coach, greatest defensive coordinator, greatest quarterback, greatest running back to ever play at Michigan all just played together and win 15 and 0 or at least everybody that i just mentioned in that category is certainly up for discussion and when you talk about everything this program has represented to college football what it has meant to the entirety of the sport one of the true blue bloods that's incredible what we just witnessed and there are so many things about this team and this season that i could say a lot of them a lot of them, frankly, we have already said. I thought what this team deserved was to be honored and to, to take what it's accomplished here, winning the program's first national championship since 1997, winning Michigan's first undisputed and unshared national championship since 1948. I think to put all of those things into perspective, there have been so many great teams in the time between those two pivotal championship seasons. So many great players, so many great moments. And yet what we've witnessed here is something that don't take for granted. We may never get to witness this ever again. It may never get witnessed by any fans of any program ever again. For example... Let's talk about some of the accomplishments of this year's team. I've collected a few. This is from my former co-publisher at Wolverine Digest, Michael Spath, who noted, in the college football playoff era, 
No national champion won five games against ranked opponents in its last six contests until Michigan. Alabama beat four ranked opponents in its last six for three of its national championships, but never five of its last six. By the way, that other team, Maryland, went eight and five, just didn't finish ranked. This is a stretch run uh, to win it all. It's unparalleled in the history books. Indeed, it is. This is the first time Michigan has ever finished in the top five of the AP poll three straight seasons. That goes back to 1936. We are now at the dawn of the Fritz Chrysler era at Michigan. I mean, this is a legendary run, even by the standards of a legendary program. That's right. This is the first time ever Michigan has finished in the top five three years in a row in the AP poll. Most college football programs have never done that, ever. And there's a lot of college football programs that don't even have three top five finishes ever. Next. Cole Kublik at SEC Network points out Michigan is the first national champion to lead at halftime in every game since Miami in 2001, which is widely considered to be the best team so far this century. Kublik also points out, look at these numbers. This is this is unbelievable. This is This is the stuff of a video game. I'm not even sure you could do this on a video game. Michigan had just five offensive turnovers all season. Three of them were the interceptions that uh, J.J. threw against Bowling Green. Only 45 penalties all season. That's an average of three penalties a game. And as Kublik points out in a word, and it's an accurate one, remarkable. Kublik also points out Michigan's 303 yards rushing is the most by any team in a BCS or college football championship game. Fox Sports points out Michigan became the first team in Big Ten history to finish a season 15-0. and So now we're talking about one of the great teams in the history of the Big Ten Conference. Tom Van Heeren at ESPN, he noted, Michigan allowed 10.4 points per game this season, which was the fewest by a Big Ten team since... Michigan's 1997 national championship team at 9.5. Both teams won the national championship, but the the style of football, not to take anything away from that is one of the great defenses in the history of college football, but the style of offense that was widely being played in 1997, the rules of the game, where you can tackle, who you can tackle, how you can defend the pass when the ball is in the air, how far down the field guys are now allowed to block with RPOs, None of this was going on in 1997. It's, it is harder to hold teams to 10.4 points per game in this era than it was to hold teams to 9.5 points per game in the previous one. Check out this stat. Michigan is the first team to allow less than 25 points in all of its games since Minnesota did it 120 years ago. 120 years ago. That's incredible. This is historic dominance by this defense. Former Michigan quarterback Devin Gardner, he went back to something J.J. McCarthy posted as a high school senior when he signed with the Michigan Wolverines. I want all Michigan fans to do this. Take three deep breaths and have faith. Faith that every single coach, player, employee in that building is doing everything they possibly can to be great. This great university demands excellence. This great fan base demands excellence. Everything that surrounds this university is simply just pure drive for excellence. Know that every single person associated with that football program is striving for excellence. There will always be a light at the end of the tunnel. They, they will not reach that light if it is being clouded by darkness. Support is the only thing that they need right now. Every single one of you has the power to contribute to the goal. We are all in this together. That's an 18-year-old kid, man. And it turned out to be prophetic. I wanted to share this. This is kind of what it's all about. This is my wife last night honoring her grandfather, the late great Dr. John, the late great Dr. Burgess, who University of Michigan Med School graduate. Him and his classmates had for over 40 years the same season tickets. And he was a man of, of great faith and also a man of science. And there you can see him sitting there at the big house back in the day fully decked out in his obnoxiously cool Michigan gear. And my wife asks, who's got it better than us? 
See, this is why we do this. That This is why we follow these teams. This is why we root for them. Those moments, those memories that get passed down, that give us something to, to inspire us away from either the, the difficulties or even the mundanity of, of regular life. And bring a lot of people from a lot of desperate, desperate eras and backgrounds and beliefs to bring them together in, in unison and in support of something uh, that is really at its best, just a source of pure joy. And that's why I wanted to close with that image. Because the factoids, the data points are, are legendary and deserve to be acknowledged. A team that will never be forgotten. And we may never see the rest of our lives another team do what this one did. Because there's been very few teams in the history of college football that have done what this team did. But ultimately, ultimately, that picture there, that's, that's why we're fans. That's what we love about it. That kind of takes, that picture there takes all of those data points and summarizes it in one picture of a happy fan who passed on several years ago, but also passed on his love of the maize and blue to his granddaughter, who's now helping me pass it on to our children. I have nothing more to say other than go blue. Well, if there was ever a time that we wanted to get the take of a buck nut, it is absolutely right now. Our good friend Mark Rogers is here with us. Yes, there he is. Uh, <laughs> look at the look on Mark's face. I think we're done here, actually. I think we're good. Everybody's already seen what they want to see, the look on his face. But when, when, Mark, when Mark is not... Uh, struggling with violating the commandment against coveting. He actually puts forth a very good college football channel, the voice of college football here on YouTube as well. And now that we're heading into the offseason, folks, this is actually when you really want to tune in. I mean, you get ahead of those futures markets with correspondents and reporters covering teams all over the country. It is a 365-day sport to mark. But right now, here on the 10-minute the, the war, we go to him more specifically for the scarlet and gray perspective. And uh, Mark, I, I just laid out some of the historical anecdotes for this team, uh, what it was accomplished, some of the incredible stats. You could play an entire season of NCAA football in a video game and not have five turnovers in a season. That's what Michigan had on offense all year in 15 games. 45 penalties total in 15 games, three a game. And no team has ever won 15 games before no teams, uh, and did so, giving up less than 25 points in every single game. This is the first team since Miami of 2001, who a lot of people think is the best team of the century so far, to, to lead at the half of every single game. I, I could go on and on and on, but what really sticks out to me is this might be the best quarterback the school's ever had. Certainly, it, 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 we've had so many great tailbacks, but Quorum's in that conversation somewhere. Maybe the best defense we've ever had. And they were all together on this one team for this one special season. And I think we got to start talking about is Jim Harbaugh now the best, the, the, Wolf, the greatest Wolverine ever. He, he quarterbacked Bo's highest rated team. He was a Heisman Trophy finalist and a Big Ten champion. Come, he's the first Michigan quarterback to throw a touchdown pass in the NFL. Only Michigan quarterback to be drafted in the first round of the NFL. And then he comes back, and he's the coach of the first time in school history Michigan has finished top five in the AP poll three years in a row. I mean, this is just, in a way, a harmonic convergence. And if you stop and think about it, Mark, it all goes back. I, don't, I want to make sure we don't miss this. It all goes back to the greatest strategic retreat since Dunkirk, and I mean it. Michigan plays that game against Ohio State in the COVID year with that depleted roster, gets annihilated on national television. Mich Michigan's hands are forced. They're going to have to fire the coach and start over. Instead, Michigan has COVID, uses that as a way to get out of the game. I'm told, I've said that from the beginning, and I was totally, you'll recall, I said that at the time, and I was totally fine with it at the time. 
that allowed Harbaugh time to, to, to regroup, take a deep breath, reassess everything, and lo and behold, the last three years since that strategic retreat has been history. Well, when you first started in on whatever whatever I was emoting there, the 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 song Tears of a Clown came to mind. <laughs> from Smokey Robinson, because my my smirts and my laughs belie the pain in my heart uh, watching what I watched last night. Yes, this was a complete team, a complete win, a complete domination. Yes, I tend to, as football analyst, take a loss from the losing side and break it down and think, okay, where were the opportunities? Where could this game have changed? And I tend to stick up for the loser and say, where were the opportunities? And they were there for the Huskies to break through, even though Michigan was the far better team and we could go through those, and I'm sure you did, a drop at midfield down by a touchdown by the running back, the backup running back on a fourth and four play, the shot that they hit downfield that was called back because of the holding, a legitimate holding call, and a few other times that Michigan allowed them to stick around. But Washington, just when you've, you're taking on a complete team that has seven or eight paths to victory, and you have one, and you rely so heavily on a positional group and a group of players, and one in particular, just once we got into that game and I saw that finely orchestrated rushing drive right out of the gate with three different running backs and hello, Donovan Edwards, where have you been? Mm -hmm. He shows up at the right time and Khalil Mullings dragging guys all over the field. Yeah, that this is just an outstanding football team. This is just a complete football team that has no weaknesses. And uh, you bring out the historical perspective and run it through. But we do know that these teams that are winning college football playoff championships now in the last 10 years are doing more so in a legitimate way, having to run through two of the three or four best teams in the country at the conclusion of the season to complete the run. You know, beating Ryan Leaf and a Washington State team that was roughly the 10th best team in the country, that's what Michigan had to do. You know, it was not their fault. That's what was in front of them. They got it done to win their last national championship. But what this team has accomplished this season and over the last three years is nothing short of remarkable. And yes, Jim Harbaugh, uh, I've been an apologist now did I forecast this kind of bounce back? I did not. I did not forecast a national championship, but I certainly stuck up for Harbaugh because I just didn't think that a guy that did and accomplished what he did at Stanford, San Francisco, and his first four or five years at Michigan, I thought that he could still pull it together and get Michigan back to top 10 status. But uh, it is hard to argue because when you, you go through what could be considered a, a fairly thin Big Ten after the top two or three and all of that, they finally got their battle-tested moments uh, throughout November and on into January. And they stepped up to every challenge and they either, when they needed to be dominant, they were dominant. When they got challenged, they put a halt to it, put a stop to it. And just the litany of players that were able to accomplish those key plays at key times shows the complete aspect of this team. Indeed. Let's let's put this into some historical perspective. And we have to I think you have to look at college football based on the eras of that because the sport now you're getting into a third century. Started, you know, 1879, 1869. So we're going into it. We're we're you know almost a third of the way through a third century of the sport now. So you know you can't really compare things into the 40s or the 30s. Or you, you got to even really even into the 80s and 90s. When you go back and watch you know classic games from the 80s and 90s on YouTube right now, and there's a there's hundreds of them there. I mean it it just doesn't look the way uh, that that we look today. I, I pointed out you know this is the best scoring defense in Big Ten history since the 1997 National Championship team. I think all but one starter on that team made made a roster in the NFL. 
that's a that was a, that's a historically one of the great defenses in college football history, but it wasn't facing the style of offenses on a daily basis. The rules, RPOs, where offensive linemen can block five yards downfield and everything else. That that stuff wasn't going on in 1997. So let's just say that like maybe the last 20 years. All right, so we're going to go back to 2003, say, and we're we're fully Im- immersed now in the the zone read era with Rich Rod bringing that to college football and. Uh, which was kind of the forerunner to the RPO. And so that let's just say the last 20 years. Is this the best, the best team from the Big Ten during that period of time that you've seen? Yes, and the reason I say that is because from the time that these athletes, meaning the skill position guys that throw and catch the football, become phenoms within their community, they throw and catch the football and are trained and coached and drilled unlike any other era. You know, the 14, 15, 16-year-olds that are going to passing camps. And so by the time they arrive at college, the advancement of the passing game and the ability of these players to throw and catch the football is extraordinary. And so that development was years later, 20 years ago. And so Michigan has had to face, this defense has put the clamps on various styles and skill levels that I just tried to outline And so for them to put up the kind of numbers that are comparable to 25 years ago is astounding because of the skill level and because the variations of offenses and and obviously somebody at some point and we can credit a number of coaches about 15 to 20 years ago figured out if we can use the, the quarterback as a runner then he's no longer taken out of the play and we're no longer playing 10 on 11 football. And that is revolutionized offense on both the NFL and the collegiate levels. Just that simple acknowledgement of, oh, let's watch the wing T from the 1930s and 40s. They had it right. Mm -hmm. Uh, Let's get back to that because it's a numbers game. And that puts so much conflict on these defensive ends and and, and, and variations of, of what these defenses have to deal with, that it's extraordinary what Michigan's been able to do from that standpoint. I know that, um, at, and, and you know, you want to talk about defensively. I mean, you could argue over the last 20 years, the two best passing attacks at the major college level were LSU 2019 and this Washington team. Uh, the Was- This Washington team certainly is in the top three, top four, if, even if it's not number two. They had 14 drives in the national championship game and had one touchdown, Mark. One touchdown and 14 drives against that Michigan defense. That's incredible. Michigan had six explosive plays in that game. Washington had one, and it came in the last eight minutes of the game. Just You just don't see teams dominate that level of offense in this era of college football. Even as great, and it was great in terms of loaded with NFL talent, that 21 Georgia defense that we ran into that buzzsaw too. But remember, it lost in the SEC championship to the number one pick in the draft and a first-round draft pick at wide receiver named Jamison Williams. So um, we just don't see what this Michigan defense did. I thought Jesse Minter was gone. I think he, I think he's gone regardless of what Harbaugh does. We were lucky to hold on to him last year. The Eagles, I'm sure, are kicking themselves that they didn't hire him when they had the chance. And you know their defense has been a major letdown for them this year. I could see him even going back to the Ravens. Um, if Mike McDonald uh, ends up getting a head coaching job, which it looks like it's going to happen in this uh, coaching uh, cycle here in the NFL. But is, is, is Jesse Minter the best defensive coordinator Michigan's ever had? Well, before we get there, uh, you bring up Washington's performance. And, and again, I go back to this collection of players at the wide receiver position in Penix and just having to rely so heavily on a few guys to pull the load that – Michigan fans, hang with me just a second. I'm going to bring you back to a good place. But I would say that Michael Penix threw the ball better against Texas. And that started with the first drive of the game against yeah. Michigan. Yeah. He he missed three. I'm charting just about every play, and he missed three throws on mm-hmm. the first drive. But this is how I would look at it. If he had roughly 40 dropbacks against Texas and against Michigan, and let's say he missed about two to four throws against Texas, and he missed more like seven or eight against Michigan – Those other 30 to 32 dropbacks, that's where the Michigan defense was on its game. Right. You know, he didn't take advantage of when he had those clean looks, but they were rare for either from a coverage standpoint or from a pressure standpoint. So the Michigan defense delivered. You can't be there every time. And uh, so so they they 
certainly benefited from some unforced errors, but those happen in every football game. They lim- they limited those unforced errors or the opportunity to make those plays to a small sample size of 40 dropbacks. So that was the brilliance of the Michigan defense from a number standpoint in looking at opportunities for an offense is they limit those to so few that you better hit on them. And of course, Washington did a few, but not enough. Which I think makes a case for Jesse Minter being the best defensive coordinator Michigan's had. <laughs> yes. Uh, M- Michigan, uh, it's just amazing. I'm going to take it from more of a culture standpoint on both sides of the ball that um, it's it's pretty brilliant. Harbaugh and his staff being able to merge the old with the new and just have such a uh, determined, physical minded team, but to bring the concepts of what they need to do from the modern game and integrated and i've mentioned this a few times and it's something that you know 10 times better than i do about this michigan football team and that's uh just the 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 blocking concepts uh you still i gotta think that people are picking up on this and seeing it across the country and going to try to replicate it uh but i don't see it uh but they're not they're not ever, ever, i love kalen DeBoer, but every, it's like the nfl in a way everybody wants to hire the next sean mcveigh and the Lions kind of hired my our, my Lions hired an old school football meathead guy, and and look how it's turned out. And 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 the Lions on a weekly basis with its two running backs are are basically you know Jared Goff is Bernie Kosar, and David Montgomery and Jameer Gibbs are Kevin Mack, and I can't remember the other guy's name, Ernest Biner. Yeah, I mean it, no one plays that way anymore. You don't practice that all week long. You don't practice that against anybody else. Now, I, we'll get into this more in the offseason. I do wonder if your school is, is thinking of this now. I saw I went out and got Quinshawn Judkins. I don't know if that means Travion Henderson will go pro or not. But if he stays, you know, you have a more mobile quarterback. I wonder if Ryan Day is like, hey, if you can't beat him, join him. Let's, let's maybe try some of this ourselves. But most, most, of, most of college football is practicing what Kalen DeBoer wants to be, who's a great coach, by the way. They're, but they're practicing what he wants to be, not what not what not what Jimmy is doing. Two more things I want to ask you, point out to you. Um, one I want to point out to you, one I want to ask you about. I know you and I have joked the last couple of years about uh, Ohio State uh, forums and message boards and Ohio State Twitter, convinced for the last three years in a row now that Michigan's played an entire roster of seventh year seniors. Right? We joked about this, and we're losing everybody every year. I want I want to run down off the top of my head if I can remember here. Who, who started and played significant minutes for Michigan last night? Let's start on offense. Offensive line, Trent A. Jones has more eligibility left. Carson Barnhart has more eligibility left. Um, Drake Nugent has more eligibility left. Uh, Ladarius Henderson and, uh, uh, and does not. Uh, Trevor Keegan does not. Uh, but that's three of the five guys that started on the offensive line last night. They do. Um, Colston uh, Loveland, more eligibility left. A.J. Barner, the other tight end, more eligibility left. Roman Wilson, more eligibility left. Cornelius Johnson does not. Uh, if you look at, uh, and, and, and then Samaj Morgan, freshman, Tyler Morris, sophomore. J.J. McCarthy, more eligibility left. Blake Corum, more eligibility left. Donovan Edwards, more eligibility left. Kalel Mullings, more eligibility left. Look on defense, Kenneth Grant, more eligibility left. Mason Graham, more eligibility left. Uh, Jalen Harrell, more eligibility left. Braden McGregor, more eligibility left. Mike Barrett does not. Junior Colson, more eligibility left. Ernest Hausman, more eligibility left. Secondary, Makari Page, more eligibility left. Um, Keon Sab, more eligibility left. Uh, Will Johnson, more eligibility left. Josh Wallace does not. Now, not all those guys are going to come back. Maybe not even half of them do. But here's the thing. Almost everybody that played a significant role in that game last night has eligibility left. That's the thing. They have figured out roster management. That's the other thing. Where you're seeing the rosters of a lot of top-tier programs now are getting decimated by the transfer portal. There's something like 15 Alabama players in the transfer portal, and like only one or two of them played significantly. One of them transferred to your school. But here's the thing, Mark. Those guys would have been the depth pieces to keep the other guys fresh at Alabama three, four, five years ago. They're departing now. 
Michigan has found a way to come up with the resources, keep those guys in school, develop them longer, keep guys happy. The amount of guys that play on defense, it, it you know, it's 18, 19, 20 guys play on defense every game, regardless of situation or who the opponent is. A lot of the players that made significant contributions last night, Mark, they could be, they, they could, they won't in many cases, but they could, they could have eligibility and play again next year if they wanted to. So you're trying to depress me, I guess, Steve, is what you're doing, but uh, it's a great point. It's a valid point. And even if Harbaugh leaves, uh, you have certainly stood up, I believe, in favor of Sharon Moore taking over. Bill Walsh handed the dynasty to George Seifert, and mm -hmm. it kept rolling, so mm -hmm. it can be done. Yeah, it's a scary proposition for the Big Ten, even if my choices are, if my choices are, because and that brings us to Harbaugh, where we, where I wanted us to wrap this up. We'll talk about him and his legacy. Let's assume he goes to the NFL, although it would be the most Jimmy thing ever. Now that it, now that it seems logical to go to the NFL, I won the national championship. I did everything I could. Now that now that we're like, it's cool, man. You you do you. You you did what we brought you here to do. We good. You know, you have a nice life. You know, and uh, go join Jimmy Johnson, Pete Carroll, and uh, Barry Switzer as the only guys to do this both in the show and in, in the college game. It would be the most Jimmy thing ever to then turn right around and say, I'm good. I'll stay. I mean, he was, he was on SVP last night talking about we're going to push spring practice back. So who knows what he's good. I mean, it's Jimmy. It's it's logical for him to go now, which is why it would be the Jimmy thing to stay. But but if 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 he does go... If my choices are, I, I do think Kalen DeBoer, who's a Midwestern guy with Michigan ties, I do think that he would be interested in this job from what I've been told. Um, if my choices are Kalen DeBoer, who's a great coach, but Sharon Moore and I get to keep Ben Herbert, I'm going to go with Sharon Moore if I get to keep Ben Herbert. Because what he has done in terms of building this culture and developing these guys is second to none. And I think the continuity of those two things is less risk for me, given where the program is at, than bringing in an outsider, even one who I think does fit who we are, even though schematically he's a lot different than what we do. I agree on Kalen DeBoer, but it sounds like you are confident that he is a smart enough individual to understand that I'm not tied to a concept, an offensive approach. We've seen other great coaches be able to morph with the uh, changes in rules, changes in approach, changes in personnel, roster changes, conference changes, all those things that Kalen DeBoer is not tied to that scheme, pass happy. He just obviously took on what he took on. Sure. Because people forget when that. he was in Indiana, they ran the ball very well when he was yeah, there. They forget they about that. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. That's a good point. All right. Let's talk about Jimmy and his legacy. Let, let's assume that this is it because if it's not it, man, I don't know if you heard his press conference the day after on Tuesday morning. But the dude, uh, I mean, this, this was the press conference equivalent of the christening scene at the end of Godfather 2. We have, we're going to settle some family business. I mean, he called out the commissioner. He called out the NCAA. Very specifically talked about revenue sharing, advocated for player unionization, which, by the way, I'm not in favor of because I think it's actually a worse deal for the players uh, in some respects. But, you know, uh, we, we can deal with that later on. The, the point being, my man emptied the tank, you know. And so that's the kind of thing you do like when Trevor Keegan said, you know, F off basically to all the people who called us cheaters. I don't have to be here anymore, so I don't care what you think. <laughs> All right. So there, that's the kind of thing that you typically do if you're on your way out the door and you're like, I got nothing to lose. So let me just go ahead and let it rip here and tell you what I really think. It would be fascinating, though, if he were to come back after doing all of that and seeing how those dominoes, um, uh, you know, would 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 fall and, and how that puzzle would work itself out over the next eight months. But ultimately, let's assume this is it for him at Michigan. What's his legacy? Well, first of all, if that was anybody else, just about anyone else, we would assume that he was out the right, door right. delivering his parting shots. But if it's Jim Harbaugh, first of all, he's kind of a loose cannon and he speaks his mind anyway. Plus, he could be kind of fired by the uh, the championship. He's he's a national championship coach now. Yep. I'm going to let it all hang out. I, maybe I haven't even made my decision, but I don't care because I'm number one 
And uh, again, he's just Jim Harbaugh. So even if he was not a national championship coach, he typically speaks his mind. Okay, his uh, at Michigan as a national champion in a modern era, and I from time to time pick on Michigan and make a little fun of asking Michigan fans to go on YouTube and find their national championship game performances. So we're bringing Michigan football into the modern era of elite status. This is a national championship that was won post-BCS era in a playoff against the best competition, not tucked away in a Rose Bowl where the Pac-10's best was the 12th best team in the country or whatever. So to do it on this stage, to beat an SEC team, to beat Nick Saban on the way to uh, the ultimate prize, to dominate Ohio State for three consecutive years, to do all those things, and not just to take over from another successful Michigan coach, but to lift the program from a seven or eight year just mire in the muck Mm -hmm. under Hoke and Rich Rod, all of that just, (laughs) along with the playing status and everything that he is, he is the ultimate Michigan man. Uh, So at the school, I got to think that uh, you made a great argument, and I tried to add to it, as the greatest Wolverine of all time. To me, I continue to respect him, and that's this is multiplied a couple times because of him taking various stops. I think this is a mark of a great coach. It's one of the very first things that I go to when I'm asked about great coaches is the ability to go to different levels, pro and college for one thing, that's rarely been done, but also to go to different style, uh, different conferences, different teams and different eras now and to pretty much replicate a rags to riches performance at all stops. He's done it now three times at major stops. That speaks volumes. Indeed it does. Thank you, brother. I know it was hard, but you were a pretty good sport nevertheless, and we appreciate it. For once, the shoe is on the other foot. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mark. Have a good one. Thanks, Aaron. Appreciate it. Three, two. And that brings us to our weekly poll results. We asked you, who do you think Big Ten Commissioner Tony Petit, I'm sorry, Petiti, Freudian slip. Uh, who do you think Big Ten Commissioner Tony Petiti is rooting for in the national championship game? Current Big Ten member Michigan or future Big Ten member Washington? 73% of you believed he was rooting for Washington. And I agree. 27% of you uh, said Michigan. I don't know how many of you guys saw that photo on social media of him getting ready, Petiti getting ready to go on a plane uh, with a bunch of Michigan fans back to the Midwest. Great photo. That brings us to our feedback of the week. And it wasn't feedback to this program, but I, I just had to single this out. This is incredible. This is from a guy named Jim Weber, who says, I still can't believe Jim Harbaugh made it back from this. There he is wearing a ridiculous mask, because all mask wearing is ridiculous. Uh, 28 to nothing. Wisconsin leading Michigan heading into the half, nationally televised primetime game, the COVID season when things were at the lowest of the low. And to think Jimmy came back from that and went 40-3 and three with three Big Ten championships, three wins over Ohio State by an average of over 14 points per game, and the school's first national title in 26 years, first undisputed national championship since the Korean War. Incredible. Absolutely incredible. Legendary, even. That'll do it for this week's episode of Michigan Podcast. Don't forget, like, rate, subscribe, share, five-star review, follow, whichever applies, however you watch, like here on YouTube or listen, like over on iTunes. We'd love it if you helped us find more Michigan fans just like you. And don't forget to light us up in the comments section as well. We appreciate those comments too. So thank you for all of those. You can follow us on Twitter. There's going to be a lot of news breaking here in the next couple of weeks. Guys, is JJ coming back? Who's going pro? Is Jimmy coming back? Who will replace him if he doesn't? Stay tuned to what we think about all those developments in real time on our Twitter feed at Michigan Podcast. That's where you can follow us there. 
at Michigan Podcast on Twitter or X, since that's what they're calling it these days. And thank you for following us there too. Incredible ride. We may never, ever get a chance to experience something like this ever again. And if this is it, if this is it, don't be sad that it's over. Be happy that it happened. I'm Steve Dace. Go Blue.